Time for VUC. In our 11th year, with us on our journey this year, Simwood.com. Simwood can turn you as a developer into a telco. Greenfield Tech. Go to greenfield.tech and see how they can make your tech dreams both feasible and affordable. Our conference bridge is the best you'll ever find at zipdx.com. VUC.me is hosted on Bluehost. And our worldwide local rate dial-ins are provided by voxphone.com. All right, and as you can see, we're live with VUC 658 for August 11th, 2017. We're going to be talking to Dr. Paul Vixie, and I won't say doctor anymore. I'm just going to say it one time. Uh, he is an amazing person, and if you don't know who Paul Vixie is uh, or his company, Farsight Security, I suggest you do a quick Google on that and check that out. Uh, Paul's got a slide up right now, but Paul, we generally ask people if you could put – uh, your other view up just for a second. Uh, I won't ask you for your whole history because that's well documented on the internet, but we generally ask people their first experience with technology. Are you willing to answer such a question, Paul? What got you into this in the uh, first place? <laughs> uh, I was in public school in San Francisco in the late 70s. In the math lab, they got some kind of federal grant to buy some, and in that day and age, you bought teletype. A 10 or 11 character per second typewriter looking thing with rolls of paper, made a lot of noise, a lot of heat, uh, drew a lot of power. Uh, but that was connected to a time-shared Hewlett-Packard system uh, that was in it. At, and that was where I learned uh, in that case, basic programming, and it, uh, you know, as a 13-year-old, it uh, was just the greatest thing I'd ever seen. That's fantastic. Um, you do have some issues with the frame rate, so, and a little bit of breaking up. I want to explain to people that we uh, had a little trouble getting started, and we're sorry we're late. Uh, Paul, we're going to let you go ahead and t t explain to us what uh, response policy zone is, I've never under, I, I, I hesitate to say, is there a plural for that? Is it, do you talk, talk about zones or is it a concept? So it's only singular. Um, both ways. Um, so, uh, as I will explain, uh, the name comes from some technical stuff, um, uh, te te technical attributes of the design. However, no one who subscribes to one of these and uses it in production will ever use just one. In the case of this presentation, I'm telling you not just what one of them is, but why you need more than one. Perfect. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's hear about it. And by the way, you, did, um, you have an article or post on, um, gosh, remind me of that, what that is. Uh, it's on... Um, ID center center ID what is that what is that uh, circle ID right circle ID yes so people can look. Uh, there is an article about this on that uh, that website and you'll have the URL for that on my last slide today perfect all right well let's go then right. let's, oh, PowerPoint has died <laughs> no. uh, don't want you guys reading my email all the luck in the world. Uh, well, it's pretty fine, so I don't think anybody can actually see what it says. All right. That's good to know. Beautiful image, though. Oh, yeah. So, uh, well, office loads, which is taking longer than it should. Um, what else? say is uh, my background DNS as well as security so I have a uh, thing um, it uh, I'm gonna recover it I admire this all is um, yeah, Paul we couldn't help but notice the odd radio or two in the background were you or are you a radio app 
I am a radio uh, aficionado. I do have general license in the amateur radio world. I don't have time to pursue that, but when I was much younger, uh, those radios in the background uh, are duplicating radios that I owned as a teenager. Uh, and and uh, I, as you probably remember, when you leave your house of origin, it's usually without a lot of uh, room for stuff. So it's uh, a lot of good radios, and now I have them back again. Um, but I don't have time to play with them because I am the CEO of a security company. Uh, uh, trying one more time here. Um, so my background includes security. I started the first anti-spam company in the mid-90s called MAPS. Uh, we invented something called the RBL that I very much wish I had patented because uh, there's no email that anyone now on the internet has in their lifetime that uh, doesn't have at least one RBL check. Um, but that's okay because, uh, you know, now I have to work. If I had patented the RBL, I would not have to work. So I'm sure it builds character. Nevertheless, um, that was the first distributed reputation system that the internet ever had, uh, where you would have a set of threat researchers trying to find out what, what was good and what was bad, and um, uh, publishing their results in real time to some set of operators who would subscribe to that in order to decide what to do. And in that case, it was who do you not accept email connections, SMTP connections from, uh, because they are known to send a lot of spam. Um, uh, I've that that was a, a use of DNS that was really quite unusual at the time. DNS normally uh, just helps you convert the host name that is at the beginning of every URL that we click on into an IP address, so that our uh, operating system knows sort of who to connect to 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 fetch this content. That's what DNS does, uh, hundreds of billions of times a day for the global internet, something like this was uh, considered innovative at the time. But I was responsible for the bind software and I had been uh, living and breathing DNS for uh, a few years by then. And um, years later, after you know, life happens, kids, companies, jobs, etc., uh, I realized that we had left the job undone and that we had a way to distribute the reputation of uh, email senders, but we did not have a way to distribute the reputation of DNS content. And that is what inspired this work, which began in about 2009. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and since you are pausing, I just want to ask um, or clarify for people who haven't used RBLs that an RBL when you want to query RBL, it's it's exactly like DNS, except if I'm not mistaken, the IPs reverse the order. Yes, uh, it is DNS, but you're looking up the address backward rather than the name forward. So, um, I don't need to say but, too much. But the IP is that. the IP. The numbers of the the four numbers in the IP, at least in IPv4, uh, are actually in reverse, if I remember correctly. Yes, they are as they would be for an inadder.arpa lookup if you were trying to translate a host address into a host name. So uh, I didn't, uh, that was not innovative uh, for, for us. It was the use of DNS to publish reputation data um, uh, and carry a completely different kind of data uh, that was novel. Yeah, and there are uh, when I got at least there. 20 or 30, there are at least 20 or 30 RBLs now, if not more, but 10, maybe 10 major ones. Yes, yes. Um, my favorite at the moment is uh, Serbal and Spam House. Uh, those guys are great, and their stuff is free for a tiny, small office, home office user like me. You only have to pay if you're a big company. Anyway, so firewalls, as they were originally conceived and as they are usually implemented, are just devices that sit somewhere in the path of traffic, and they have an opportunity to uh, pass or fail uh, everything that passes through them and uh, tries to pass through them. Uh, so almost all of us have a firewall of some kind, even the small cheap plastic boxes that we use for DSL at our houses have limited firewall capability. This is uh, now almost universal, is to assume that uh, some things that try to get through shouldn't. And you have to have a knob where you can decide uh, how much of what doesn't get through. 
Uh, and this, of course, has been ex extended. There are email firewalls. There are web firewalls or web filters. Uh, the, the idea of sitting in the path of traffic in order to uh, let some through, deny others, uh, is now, again, almost universal. It's, it's not just at the, the, the packet level as it was in the late 80s when it first came into existence. Um, and all of these firewalls have a in, incredibly uh, self-similar configuration method. There are rules. And in every one of those rules, you've got a trigger of some kind. In other words, if this happens, or if you see this, or if the, the content matches this condition, uh, and then they have an action, which is to say, uh, if, if, you, if the trigger fires, then this is what you're going to do. This is the act you're, you're going to take, uh, which could often just be to drop the traffic, or it could be to send a rejection uh, packet or something like that. Um, and this is no different. Uh, our RPZ fits that general paradigm as a DNS firewall. Um, there we go. So um, I want to show a picture uh, to really explain what I mean by this, but uh, DNS has a data path. Uh, DNS probably looks either very complicated or not complicated at all if you don't live and breathe it every day. And it turns out that it's mostly not very complicated. There are only three kinds of protocol speakers in the domain name system. Uh, your stub resolver would be, let's say, your laptop, your smartphone, your virtual servers, your physical servers. Anything that needs to make DNS lookups as part of its work uh, is a stub resolver. And uh, the questions that they are sending are being sent to a recursive name server. That's the middle of the, uh, of the data flow. And the recursive name server is probably the most complicated bit of all uh, because it's getting all these questions from local stub resolvers. Uh, and it is either answering them from its cache, which is very fast, or it is uh, having to run out into the authority network and go gather the data that would comprise an answer, put that into the cache, and then send it as an answer. Uh, and so this is where almost all DNS bugs and vulnerabilities and uh, people having bad days uh, because of DNS uh, being broken, it's because of that recursive. And the recursive is told to you by your ISP. Uh, that would include the Wi-Fi in a coffee shop. That would include your home ISP. That's if you're at work, it's probably not coming from your ISP. It's probably coming from your IT department. But the point is that uh, the recursive is usually very close to the stub, usually operated by the network operator who's providing connectivity. Um, and that makes it ideal for our purposes. And then finally, there's the authority layer. Uh, that's where data comes into the domain name system from outside. Right? If you've got a bunch of data in a file somewhere and you want to publish it in the DNS, uh, you are going to run or perhaps hire someone else to run an authority name server in order to move that content off of your file system and out into the DNS. And that's it. Those are the only three kinds of things that, that, that exist, and that makes the whole thing go. Uh, we do our work at the recursive layer, and again, I'll have a picture of this in a moment. Um, and that gives us the ability to allow or deny various kinds of traffic for the local user population who has access to that recursive name server. Uh, so this is very much an opt-in consideration. If a stub uh, does not want this type of filtering, then they may have to change ISPs or they may have to, I don't know, use Google's 8.8.8.8 thing, or there's a lot of options. If the stub does not feel that the recursive uh, has aligned interests with them, uh, this, is, this is, can't be used for, uh, mandatory censorship. Uh, but if you see it as a feature, and a lot, a lot of people do, then the fact that the stub is very close to the recursive uh, means that you probably know the person who's running it, or at least you could send them email and ask them what's going on. Um, now that between this as a firewall, uh, fitting the general concept of firewall and other uh, firewalls, is that most firewalls do not have the ability to lie. They can't replace the content uh, that is happening that's trying to pass through it with different content that uh, is considered somehow superior in policy terms uh, to the original content. Um, I know that does happen, but that's just not the traditional uh, meaning of a firewall. Uh, but we have to do that here because what, you're, what we're trying to do is to protect applications and users from malicious people 
who have put malicious things into the DNS. And what you want to be able to say is, uh, if you're looking up something that uh, the recursive operator considers to be dangerous, uh, you need some answer. You can't just time out. They'll just, if you time out, you get a long delay, and then uh, the, the user will have to click again and so forth. What you need to do is to send them something to say, uh, you tried to do something that I'm not going to let you do. And so you're essentially inserting false signaling. You're, you're, you're sending, you're transmitting a lie because in your considered belief as a recursive name server operator, you think the lie is going to be safer, more constructive than the, what the truth would have been. Uh, and an example of that is uh, you clicked on something that we know is a phishing site. You probably clicked on a link in email and that email was spam and the spammer is hoping you click on something because if you do, then they're going to try and inject your, your browser with malware. And since we don't want the result, we don't want that whole chain of events to occur, we're going to stop it up front, which is you tried to look it up and we wouldn't let you. We told you that what you were trying to look up doesn't exist. That's a lie. It really does exist, but it's better for you to believe the lie. Uh, so there's a certain amount of um, faith keeping that goes on in all of this. Uh, I know that some of that sounds hokey, uh, but um, uh, honestly, it works. Um, we were not the first to do this. Uh, I was the founder of a company called Nominum, uh, who is a as co-founder and first chairman of Nominum. Uh, they're a commercial DNS ser uh, services and products company. They have some excellent name servers. Uh, and after I left them in the, I guess, late 90s, they, uh, they, they proceeded uh, to do other interesting stuff. And one of the things they did was to add this type of DNS firewall capability to their commercial recursive name server. Uh, however, they did not seek to make it a general standard. It was something that they, they felt was a uh, proprietary advantage for their customers and their products. And so although they've been doing it uh, at least eight years longer than I've been, maybe seven years longer than I've been doing it, uh, they, they didn't try and create a community around it as I have done. Uh, nevertheless, in 2009, Vernon Shriver is uh, one of my colleagues, uh, and I uh, decided this, it, was, uh, it was terrible that bad guys got good DNS and we needed to give them differentiated services, and that's when we invented this. Um, now, the name RPZ is hokey. It is something only an engineer would think of. You can tell there were no marketing people in that room uh, on that day uh, because it uh, describes the architecture in, uh, in three words. Uh, we, it is response policy. In other words, sometimes you don't tell the truth. You, you tell some lie instead. And that response policy is carried in a zone. And a zone is the unit of data exchange in the DNS itself. Um, so we're using uh, the zone format and the ability to transfer zone data inside the DNS. We're essentially using that as a bearer channel for something that uh, really is not traditional DNS content at all. Um, anyway, it's, uh, even though it's a terrible name set by engineers, it is at least distinctive. Uh, the, no one else called their thing the same thing. So at least you know that if you hear this name, it means this thing. Um, now, I don't want to get too deep into zones and zone transfer. That's something only a DNS geek could really love. But I will say that my work in the 1990s uh, included improving zones and zone transfers. Uh, I was a DNS guy back then. And um, we needed to, uh, to get zones to move around a little faster. It used to be you'd make a change to some zone file on your hard drive and you'd click the go button or you'd you know, enter a CLI command to say, you know, please re reload that zone. And you'd reload it locally, but then the rest of the internet would know about it. And they might not know about it for hours. Um, and then when they did know about it, it would be because they had to fetch the entire edited new zone. Even though all you did was add one little thing to it, uh, there was no way to send just the new thing. Uh, so all of that got fixed. Uh, we have the ability, when you make a change to a zone, to tell the internet about it right now. And they have the ability, that your designated publication servers, uh, at the other end of this, this, this uh, protocol, can reach out to you and say, look, I've got serial number X. Please give me all the changes that are later than that. And then I will have serial number Y. And um, that's the incremental zone transfer method. And we also have a way of signing these with digital signatures. 
so that uh, you can't have somebody hijack your zone transfer as would have worked back in the old, old days. So it is timely, it's efficient, it's authentic. It is, in other words, exactly what we would have had to build if we were not using the DNS zone as our bearer channel. And so uh, the, 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 uh, it was a compromise. We, we were you know, perfectly aware that using a zone for this was odd, and the zones themselves are very ugly. But it wasn't a big compromise because we got exactly the features we wanted. Anyway, so that's, that's the history of the, the odd name that we picked. So I promised a picture. This is it. I told you before there would be stub resolvers uh, talking to recursive servers that had caches. And when they're asked a question that is, can't be answered from cache, they go up into the authority servers. Um, I do want to uh, do a PSA, public service announcement here. Uh, in between the stub resolver and the recursive server, um, there is a great deal of personally identifiable information, uh, usually abbreviated as I've done here with PII. PII is uh, dangerous stuff. Uh, it is, um, it's how corporations and bad guys and governments and uh, maybe our parents, if we're, we're rebellious t teenagers and so forth, looking at our PII is how the people who want to supervise our activities figure out what those activities are. And um, you should really not leak PII. Uh, my, my friend Dan Gear has written extensively about digital exhaust and the, the path of, of digital debris that we all leave as we surf the internet and live our lives. Uh, and I, I, I commend anybody to go to YouTube and type Dan Gear's name in because it's uh, this is an important topic. Um, so uh, if you are using 8.8.8.8, .8 .8 .8, then there is a lot of PII being exposed to all of the networks in between you and Google. And of course, your PII is being exposed to Google, but they have published a pri privacy policy for that service that I think is, is safe and sane. But I'm not worried about Google. I'm worried about everybody in between who's probably running some thin margin business and uh, data mining the, 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 the information that passes through their part of the network might be the only way they're making payroll. And um, so even though I've, I, I've got a lot of confidence in Google and also OpenDNS who does something similar, uh, I really think it's better to run a recursive name server yourself in your own house, on your own property, if you're a business, uh, inside your own network. So that all that PII is contained where you're the only one who can see it. Because there's a lot, I mean, there's still a leakage of minor PII above the recursive, but it's very minor. And uh, that's something we have to live with, whereas this PII thing is something you don't have to live with. There are a lot of good open source name servers. You don't have to pay money to do this. And there are also very good appliances and commercial services. So if you want to outsource it, you can. Uh, I just want everybody to please consider running a recursive name server close to themselves, close to their stub, stub resolvers. And one of the great benefits is that then you can use RPZ. Um, because that's where RPZ functions. Um, and in this picture, you can see that uh, we're using another technology called DNS tap to monitor the activities of the recursive name server. And then that goes into your security operations center or a syslog file or something uh, where you then decide what your policy ought to be by looking at what the previous activities of your name server have been. You don't have to do that. And most people don't, but I'm putting that in there because um, T looking at what the internet is really doing is how any threat information provider uh, knows what threats to warn you about. So if you're not monitoring, then somebody else somewhere has to be monitoring something in order to build the response policy that then feeds your recursive name server. Uh, so anyway, this is the data flow. And this is what it looked like in 2012 or so when I was demonstrating it to an audience. Um, webcam chat with Russian girls. Um, and datefy.ru was a domain name in, in the dot Russia. It's the, the Russian top level domain. And you know, I have a lot of friends in Russia. I love to visit there. I especially love their food and their beer and their vodka. Uh, but this particular spammer it was using that as the host for whatever web services they wanted you to click on. And if I had clicked on this, it would certainly have tried to uh, infect my machine. 
but you can see it was Mozilla Thunderbird. It was probably a Linux box of some kind, so the infection might not have worked. Uh, anyway, uh, I clicked on it. It didn't work, and I um, decided that probably the reason it didn't work was RPZ. So I asked DNS to please tell me the answer to uh, datefy.ru and give me the address for that, which is what your web browser would do if clicking on it was if you clicked on it. And you can see I've highlighted in red that the status of the answer is NX domain, and that's that's DNS geek speak for that the name you're looking for doesn't exist. Uh, now I knew that was a lie because I'm a DNS, a powerful DNS wizard, and I was able to find out by asking other sources. I knew it actually did exist. Uh, so then, also highlighted in red, you can see an additional section down below. This is not something that my browser looks at, but it's something that's a diagnostic that you can see in command line mode, as, as I've shown here. Uh, this came from Serbal, uh, which is Jeff Chan's excellent uh, sort of first and first and a half generation uh, thread information feed about domain names. And so you can even tell what their serial number was. So if you're wondering, maybe they blocked something by mistake, you need to be able to tell them when you're complaining about the mistake that your RPZ provider has made, you need to be able to say, I saw the bug in serial number thus and such, because that's how they're going to figure out where in their workflow this got added. Uh, but anyway, um, this is it in a nutshell. This is what happens. You, you try and look something up. One of your policies has a trigger on what you're looking up, and then you get an action, which is to insert a false negative signal. And then your browser does what it would normally do if you clicked on a typographical error or something else which truly doesn't exist, which is to give you a 404 message or something like that. Um, so that's, that's uh, uh, this is where the rubber of RPZ meets the road of, of DNS. So um, this is the bind9 config file for my name server. Most of it is deleted for... Uh, Clarity, uh, but you can see that in the options block, we simply added this response policy clause, and we've listed three zones from which policy should be able to come. And I've highlighted in red that it was the second of the three, Serbal, that uh, was responsible for the, the answer I just uh, just showed you. Uh, you should always plan on subscribing to at least two RPCs because the very first one, as you'll see here, is going to be a local one. Uh, I don't publish dnspolicy.vix.com, but if, I, if somebody is annoying me, I need a place to put my personal triggers and actions so that I can protect myself and my family. Uh, I also have some whitelisting in there because there are some DNS lookups that I have to make sure they succeed, even if they're also spammers or even if they are also fishers or criminals or whatever. Um, and so by listing a local zone first in this config file, it gives me an opportunity to say uh, there should be no policy impact if it's this name or that address or that name server, whatever. And once I've protected everything that I would be out of business if I couldn't reach it, then I fall through to my external RPZs uh, where uh, terrible things happen to terrible people. So. Uh, later on in that same config file, we have this block, because if it's going to be a zone, then you have to declare it as a zone. Uh, and this is all by nine stuff, although most other name servers have replicated some part of, of this, uh, this method, if not this syntax. So all I've done is to declare it as a secondary zone, and I've said who the master servers are. This is where you fetch the content, and this is who's allowed to send you real-time notifications. So, uh, this also notify business uh, just means I have some other local recursive servers. I'm probably the only house in America that has three. Uh, uh, it used to be my industry, so complicated uh, and flaky here. Uh, but anyway, I don't want all three of my name servers to have to fetch this content. Uh, and I used to have a slow link. And I don't think that uh, the Serbal people would thank me for transferring it three different times either. So I transferred once on this name server, and then I tell my other name servers from here, by the way, I've got a new serial number for this. Maybe you should fetch it from me. So I'm just sort of proxying for them. And of course, you have to tell it what file all this is to be stored in. Um, if you're using, let's say, a uh, Blue Cat 
appliance for your DNS, which I know a lot of companies do, you're not looking at this config file. There may be a way for you to see it, but there won't be a way for you to change it. Through some user interface, you'll pull down some menu. You'll say, I want to do, I don't know, add a zone, and then I want to add a policy. Exactly how to find that in the GUI is uh, uh, up, up to you guys to figure out. But the point is, they all use bind. And so this feature is there somewhere. And if you can't find it easily, then they probably have an FAQ on their website. And if you go there and say, what about RPZ? They'll give you whatever arcane recipe it takes to actually let you do this. Uh, because this is the biggest thing to happen in DNS in a decade. I wish I had understood how important it was in 2009. I might have started a company around that instead of doing what I did. But um, if you look at the content of the zone, as I've shown you in the command line example at the bottom, uh, you'll see exactly how we encode that NX domain uh, signaling, uh, which is a C name that's kind of like a DNS uh, uh, alias almost. It's saying, you, I know you looked up one thing, but the real answer is another. Uh, and we've got a C name to dot. And dot is the shortest possible domain name. And this pattern, C name to dot, does not occur in nature. There's no non policy record in any zone that would be a C name to dot. So that we figured that was a safe way to encode our stuff because it could never be confused with real DNS content. And all of our encodings are that way. That's why this is a zone that I like to say is so ugly that not even its mother could love it. Um, but the encoding is uh, otherwise quite simple. You can see the name you looked up, datefy.ru, dot, and then the name of the RPZ, and then 180 was a meaningless time to live figure. IN is a meaningless class indicator, so those are boilerplate. And it triggers on the left. If you look this name up, and then the action is on the right, then uh, you're going to get an NX domain. Um, and we tried to keep it as simple as possible. Uh, I am an Emacs user rather than VI, but uh, nevertheless, a VI user would have no trouble editing policy, sort of uh, how to encode your triggers and actions into this particular uh, ugly language. That you're going to want an internal feed, uh, both so that you can things that are hurting you personally that your threat providers don't know about, and also whitelist the things that you cannot live without, that you want to make sure that even if they wind up in one of your external feeds because they're a spammer, that you can still look them up. So that's kind of important. Uh, if, if you have a parent corporation, it would be good to list all of their names and addresses there, because if, uh, if your parent corporation owns you, that means they probably don't have to worry about whether you think they're a spammer or not. Uh, but you can miss a paycheck if you can't look up their names. So that would be an example of, of something you'd whitelist. Um, and you should certainly consider building your own feed uh, internally because most of us have got a, at least an ad hoc, if not a formal workflow, where we notice that certain things are dangerous and um, you know that, that, that could result in a firewall rule in your IP firewall where you talk to your, your ISP, you might say, look, if the packet comes from this network, I want to drop it. Uh, but this is another way to do that. You can say if the, if the email message mentions this domain name, then uh, make sure that no lookup is going to succeed there. Um, if you do a really great job, if you become an artist at creating content in this way, please consider offering your feed to the rest of the world. If you have a corporate legal department, they will tell you you can't do it because of liability reasons. If you don't, then you should consider whether your threat information, if it was also used by a lot of other people, would help you put uh, downward pressure on your attackers. Because when they make themselves known, yours won't be the only network that shuns them. It'll be anyone else who subscribes to your feed. And that type of crowdsourcing is what we're going to need if we're going to restore the balance between good and evil on the internet. So I've only mentioned one trigger so far, which is that if you ask a certain question, then you trigger this rule. That's the QName rule shown here. Um, but there are four others. Because sometimes you don't know what the name is going to be. Uh, but you know the address will have to be in some network if it's going to be this attacker or this attack. 
And so rather than hooking on to this content with the, the query name, uh, you would hook onto it with the response address. Told that RIPE, who allocates internet address space in Europe, actually, I think 145 countries, uh, had a problem where they were um, granting local internet registry, so-called LIR status, to various people in uh, Europe, uh, in particular Eastern Europe, but that doesn't matter, uh, who were spammers. And they were pretending to be ISPs who needed address space, but they weren't. They were just going to use it for nefarious purposes. And uh, for a while, RIPE didn't have a way to determine that these people were not truly ISPs. It's hard to have legal support in 145 countries. Um, so all of that address space is crap. And you don't want to answer anything, I'm telling you right now, you don't want to answer anything to your local stub population if the IP address that it would lead to is inside one of those blocks. And Spam House has done a wonderful job categorizing and cataloging those blocks. And they call it the do not route or peer, the drop, D-R-O-P uh, list. And so if you import the D-R-O-P in RPZ form, then all those people who pirated all that address space by looking at weaknesses in the right policy do anything that uh, would rely on you making a DNS lookup that led to one of them. And that's kind of cool. You know, we couldn't stop the addresses from being handed out. We probably can't get them back. Uh, but firewalling them at the packet level would be hard, whereas firewalling them at the DNS level is pretty easy. There's other times you don't know the query name, you don't know what address it's going to be, but you're sure that if a certain name server, a certain authority name server was involved, then the content is going to be malicious. Uh, and in that case, you move to the NS name or NS adder uh, triggers, where you take the name or the network block of uh, a name server, and you say, that's my policy hook. Um, and it's otherwise uh, very similar to the rest. Uh, this is actually the most complicated and powerful part of RPZ, as Satter. Uh, that's where all the bugs have come from, but uh, we haven't had a bug in that in the last two years. It is, uh, it, this is huge because uh, people need, uh, bad guys need good name service. And so they're not going to be moving these things around endlessly. A good name server doesn't move around very much. And so if they've got a good name server, then you can uh, catalog all of their other content just because of what name server would have published it. Uh, and finally, you can decide that it's the stub IP address that would cause you to, uh, to get a, a certain uh, rule trigger. And the way this gets used uh, is to return a, a C name, an alias, uh, to a certain internal server. Um, and usually that is an Nginx or an Apache or some kind of web server. And it only does one thing. No matter what question you ask it, it's going to answer with a page saying, hey, you, and you shouldn't have, here is the schedule of IT security training courses. Uh, please call the following number in order to sign up for one. And so that would be what we call a walled garden. And if you want to put somebody in a walled garden, you can. So, um, and there are other ways to do it, but we got asked to add this, so we did. Now, once you trigger on one of those things, you have some options as to what kind of lie you're going to constructively tell. I've mentioned NX domain. That's where you lie and say some, the name doesn't exist that actually does. There, I've mentioned alias. That's where you would just answer to say, here's a C name to somewhere. And uh, then you control whatever that somewhere is so that they get the experience you want them to get instead of the experience that their attacker wanted them to get. Uh, no error is uh, terminally obscure. We're skipping it. Uh, replace would be kind of like alias. You want to say, if you made an A record lookup, in other words, trying to find the address, I'm going to give you a different address than the truth. I'm not, this is different from a C name, although it's used in pretty much the same way. And finally, you can bypass. That's the waitlisting I talked about. So if you want to make sure that certain things do not get any policy applied to them, uh, then you use a bypass rule because that will cause it to not look at any other RPZ further down the chain. Um, so that's it. It's, uh, it's a policy language, but it's really pidgin English. Uh, yeah, there's, there's no ifs, there's no ands, there's no uh, curly braces. It's not that kind of policy language. To be very fast and very simple so that while you're doing what a recursive name server does, 
which requires uh, it's a fairly complex operation and it's happening hundreds or hundreds of thousands of times per second. This is just one more lookup you can make. Uh, there's no, it's not a true programming language with plugins and loops and external callbacks and the rest of it. Paul, what Hello. is the best URL for you know? <laughs> to, we want to make sure that you weren't that you were done uh, speaking. What is the best URL? What's the best place for people to find out more about this? Because uh, you know, watching the presentation is fascinating in the slides, but there's a lot of problems with retention, at least at my age. Uh, what What's the best well, reference for all this, especially the language? So I was not entirely done. I was waiting for my slow PowerPoint to move, but if you want me to. Move to the last slide. I've got the URLs no, there. Can... Okay. Well, we'll wait. We'll wait. I thought with a okay. long pause, and then you said hello. No, so. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Um, you always want to know if you're talking into a dead mic, right? No, no. So you're... there's a lot of lot of cool stuff you can do. Most botnets uh, don't use a single IP address or domain name for the bots to reach their command and control server anymore. They are using what's called DGA, domain generation algorithm. Uh, where you compute a squirrely looking random char character string, random looking character string, and sometimes the current time. That's how Conficker worked. And um, you can't, probably can't stop people inside your network from getting infected with those, uh, those bots. But you can stop those bots from being able to reach their command and control servers. So they'll just become weird zombies wandering around inside your digital house, unable to. Uh, be told who to DDoS or what to steal. Uh, and so there are companies out there, uh, Internet Identity had a DGA-based RPZ where they would compute for you all of today's DGA names for all known botnets. And then you would just subscribe to that feed and then you could be certain that uh, even if you got infected by one or more of those botnets, uh, your bots could not reach their, their master. Um, and that's something I don't know another way to do. That was... Uh, a, a very big need in the community that was waiting for something like RPZ to make it possible. Um, at my house, I've got uh, Postfix is my SMTP server, and it is configured to look up all of the names in the SMTP envelope, all of the names in the header, and all of the names in the body. And if it gets an NX domain, you know, that you know, so, some name was used in this email that, that doesn't exist, it will gray list that. In other words, not quite reject it, but not quite accept it either. And um, that is a huge spam stopper for me because if I have made certain names not be resolvable, uh, those names can't be used in email that actually reaches any of my family's inboxes. Uh, so that's a way that you can kind of connect several different building blocks into one interesting defense chain. Um, I've mentioned the Spam House DROP list, and the Cymru, Team Cymru has a lot of public, uh, public access data, including the Bogons list. So I subscribe to both of those. Um, and uh, you know, the sky's the limit. My opinion is uh, that no tool is successful until it's been used in some way that the tool maker could never have imagined. And so I, this is out there. It's been out there for six, seven years. And I am waiting to find out what, what people do with it. Um, I, I wish this hadn't been necessary. I would much rather be able to get a domain name taken down if it's only being used maliciously. Uh, but there, the DNS value chain is full of so many registrars and a few registries also who don't care about spam. They don't care about botnets. They've got some policy that says, nope, if you register a domain name, then that's yours forever. Uh, others have got an interesting workaround, which is the, if they get a complaint, they pass the complaint on to the domain owner and give them 72 hours to clear up what they imagine is, is not an intentional problem. Uh, this is all useless, and it means that the DNS can be used against the Internet by any malicious actor because we all volunteer our cooperation. We all speak this common protocol, and we all respect each other's content. And uh, Boy, when, when something I helped build gets used against me to uh, hurt, hurt me in some way, that will get me out of bed faster in the morning. And um, so I wish we didn't need to do takedown on our own doorsteps. I'd like to do takedown in the middle or at the far end, but we can't. So we, we now have this. 
Um, we're coming down again, like two slide left. We didn't patent this. There's no licensing. It is free. Um, we are trying to make it an IETF standard, so it'll have an RFC number. And after we get to that point, then Vernon and I will probably stop working on it because the community will then revise RPC into the future. Uh, but uh, at the moment, this is a somewhat private and yet still very open standard. And you'll find it in bind, you'll find it in unbound, cannot, and power DNS. Um, and um, you'll find it in any appliance that uses any of those uh, protocol engines. And so it's out there. And so you, if anybody tells you you have to pay money to get DNS firewalling, send them to me and I will explain it to them. That's not to say that my day job does not sell content in RPZ format. So getting access to content, you may have to pay for, but the, the raw ability to run this protocol is something that you won't have to pay for. So I'm gonna make these slides available uh, to VUC uh, so that you don't have to take a digital picture of this. Uh, but really these are the nine steps that you would take uh, if you wanted to get started with this. And I realize that nine steps sounds like a lot of, a lot of steps, but uh, if you are a sysadmin of more than like one or two years experience and you're comfortable on the Linux or BSD command line, these nine steps will take you less than two hours and uh, they will be fun. Uh, so uh, please don't be daunted. It, it really is as simple as I'm making it out to be. Let's talk about SOPA. Um, some years ago, maybe five years ago now, uh, the luxury goods industry uh, and the, uh, the commercial art industries, uh, so the movies, the, the musics, the, uh, the sunglasses, the purses, all the, the people who were really getting a lot of counterfeiting done online, uh, and they were you know, having their customers lured by fake merchandise, having the right logo, but not having paid any license fees, not having been made in the factory that, uh, that they own and so forth. And they went to US Congress and said, uh, we need help. We need it to be that the domain names that our counterfeiter uh, people are using can be shunned by the entire US economy. And so there was born this law called, that's not a law, a proposed law called COICA. It was later called Protect IP. And on the day it died, it was called SOPA. And it took about two years for it to work its way through those three names. Uh, and the idea, in a nutshell, was that the, there'd be a, a special federal court, similar to the FISA court, uh, and the Justice Department would sites and other online things that had domain names, which were, and I quote, dedicated to infringement, unquote. Uh, and then they would pass their evidence to this special court. And if the court agreed that it really was that, uh, so there were some checks and balances. Then, by the law of the land, every ISP had to uh, reject DNS lookups for those names. Um, now, I am generally in favor of commercial art. Um, I myself have some books in print. I'm not a musician of any kind, but I, I think that art deserves protection. I am not one of these people who thinks that content can have desires and that one of the things it wants is to be free. Uh, I think that is all bull. Um, nevertheless, uh, I had to oppose this because uh, the thing they wanted to do would have had two results. One, as you can see here, if you put security in the way that is not well aligned with the people who are experiencing it, they will drive around. Um, and so it wasn't going to be effective against any determined uh, infringer, right? If you want, for, for whatever reason, to get pirated copies of music or movies or whatever, this won't stop you. On the other hand, it would prevent DNSSEC, which is a security uh, protocol extension for DNS, it would prevent DNSSEC from being able to be deployed. So it was going to have no good effect and at least one terrible effect. So I spent more time in that two-year period inside the Washington Beltway than the rest of my life combined. And so try to imagine my surprise when I'm in some congressional staffers conference room talking to a bunch of interns and one of them says, but Dr. Vixie, 
you just invented RPZ, and now you're here telling us it doesn't work. And I thought, oh boy. Um, I didn't realize that they were going to do their homework. Um, anyway, uh, what I said is RPZ will work if the person who is, you know, the browser it is, the stub resolver in, in my picture, uh, feels that the policy is good for them. In other words, it's protecting them against things that they don't want to see. Uh, so you could use this the same way you would use antivirus or anything else, right? If it's seen as a virtue, it will be used. Uh, but it can't, you can't mandate this. Uh, it's just there's no way to turn this into something that everybody has to do, which is what this law is trying to accomplish. Um, so um, I, I want to say to those of you who are concerned that I have gone over to the dark side and I am helping censor content on the, in on the Internet, uh, in a way, I am. I, I want differentiated services. Uh, I want what would be called a non-neutral network. Uh, if you are a bad guy, the internet depends on cooperation. I think that cooperation has to be revocable, because it's clear that a uh, large population, uh, a large subset of the human population, wants to use your cooperation against you and use mine against me. And so. Um, uh, in one sense, uh, that's exactly right. I, I, I want uh, bad service for bad people. Uh, but the definition of bad has to be compatible. So I really don't, this, this could not be used, for example, to do what the Great Firewall of China does as far as outlawing certain parts of the Internet or certain content. Uh, it just it can't be used for the type of censorship that I'm worried about. It can be used for the type of censorship that I think we all need in order to sort of take back the streets. I promised URLs, and if this ever flips the page for me, I'll have one for you. Um, ID post, where we first announced this, it was about a year old at that time, but that was when we first published it. Um, it's important to know when you first published it because this has now been patented by others but their patents are all later than my article. So uh, we are the prior art that defeats those patents. Um, and I'm not opposed to patents in general, but you can't patent something that I invented years ago and get away with it, I'll stop you. Um, there is, uh, of course, uh, um, a knowledge base article that I wrote, uh, ISC was my company at that time. Uh, so that's still got some really good background information. There is a mailing list so that if you are uh, especially if you're publishing content in this way and you want to talk to other people who are publishing threat information content in this format, you might want to look into that mailing list. The archives are public, so you can uh, determine for yourself whether you care about it. And finally, here is the URL that is the anchor of everything. Right. So everyone in the RPZ industry knows who I am, and they always come to me and say, by the way, I have a new policy feed in that format would you please list it on the website? And then we do that. So we're kind of uh, the cool side of the day in the early days of RPZ. If you want to know what's available, it's there. If you want to know how to get it working on your particular name server, the instructions are here and so forth. Uh, and that's it. That's uh, what I came here to tell you. I'm sorry for all the technical uh, stuff, but I have to reinstall Windows or something. Uh, but I'm available for questions. Great, thank you, Paul. Corrado has some questions, and I'd like to remind you to put your uh, camera back on as well. Well, you can leave. I guess you can leave the addresses on for a while. Yeah, People can leave, easily yeah. Google that, though. Go ahead, uh, Corrado. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, thank you, Paul, for the very exhaustive, exhaustive explanation of the, the uh, your work. Uh, one of the uh, most complained uh, problems about uh, DNS redirection and other services is RF RFC compliance. So if you have a DNS server that is responding in, in a non-standard format, redirecting something, uh, let's say hijacking the, the, the response, sometimes is detrimental to um, other services, uh, including because when you surf a web page, there are so many different uh, servers you're interrogating, so some pages wouldn't load correctly. Uh, but the fact that we can use just a simple NX domain and configure that as we want, uh, that makes the, all these questions go away. Uh, I guess, uh, Probably uh, the only thing to do next 
is to get uh, modules to be implemented in uh, um, common appliances like PFSense to implement those policies. Uh, is there any work being done uh, by you or any in your team? Turn my camera back on. Um, so PFSense is a packet level firewall um, and can in a packet level firewall put in a policy that says that if somebody's trying to reach some destination, doesn't matter what the destination is, but they're trying to do it on UDP port 53 or TCP port 53, that packet where it's trying to go instead redirect it to maybe the local host, maybe the PFSense host, uh, so that you can essentially um, self into the DNS data path. So that if somebody, uh, if you want to uh, enforce this policy, and they don't, they don't know that you are capable of policy or that you're capable of DNS service, uh, that you could do that. You could pull aside these packets and answer them through policy. Um, I really don't recommend that. Um, I think that if people are using 8.8.8.8 as their name server, uh, you should use PFSense to learn that from NetFlow and talk to them about it and tell them how they could improve. Yeah. Most of your users won't be selecting their name server. They're getting it from DHCP, and so you could just tell them in your DHCP response, by the way, here are the recursive name servers, and yes, by the way, those, those, those speak RPZ. Uh, but I, I really don't like the sort of policy routing method capturing DNS questions so that you can an answer them locally. And I'm, I'm, I'm being very explicit about that because a lot of the small plastic boxes that uh, feed our cable links or our DSL links or our Wi-Fi links have this feature built in and they consider it a feature. Uh, I think it is a terrifying bug and it should be stamped out. Yeah, the, 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 the DNS resolver in some commercial routers are full of bugs and, and a disaster. But PFSense is using Unbound, Unbound, or whatever you want to pronounce it. Uh, so it can be a, an internal DNS resolver, and you can create zones. Uh, the only thing is you need to do that literally from the command line, uh, creating a, a module a graphical module that allows you to create those, these policies for unbound in uh, the PFSense appliance to create those policies, it would be more, much more user friendly. Uh, PFSense is also a DHCP server, so it could be the core of the entire network. Uh, I'm just mentioning PFSense, but there are so many others that do that uh, service for the network. So. Uh, I think that could be probably a, a, a keystone, a, a cornerstone to get uh, this new um, type of, of service from DNS protection, uh, virus and then the spam and everything in the core of the networks, local networks, as close as possible to the stubs. Yes, um, the core of the local networks is the edge of the global network, and the edge is where. Um, so I know the PFSense developers, and I haven't spoken to them about this, but I can certainly put a bug in their ear. What they're likely to say is, you know, it's open source. If you want to add that, uh, here's the GitHub address, and I'll say I don't have time. So the conversation's <laughs> going to go. But we're speaking to a larger audience uh, today, and so perhaps someone will take it uh, upon themselves to try to implement what you described. Actually, the uh, the PFSense community has evolved a, queer, a fair bit in in the past year. Um, they and NetGate, uh, the project and NetGate have become very close, and consequently, they have more resource um, than nice. you might imagine, or more resource than has happened before. Um, they're still open source, but they are um, in better shape than they have been. I'm glad to hear that. Um, but PFSense is one example of many. We have to double digit fraction of the internet edge with this type of filtering if we're really going to cause the bad guys to reconsider how much DNS they really want to be using. And we're not going to do that if you have to edit config files like I just showed you, or if you have to buy a commercial appliance like Infoblox. 
So uh, the, the, the market represented by PF Sense, I think, could be very important for us. Yeah, PF Sense and DDWRT and the like sort of uh, covers yeah. a significant market segment. James, you had a question, I think. Well, yes. Yeah, like anything else um, in this space, the uh, the challenge is how to implement things uh, globally right across the internet, and that, that's incredibly difficult. But um, I think, Paul, what the stage we're at at the moment is this uh, is a stage of just raising the awareness just so that people understand what the heck is going on here because whilst uh, whilst it's perfectly clear for for dns wizards like yourself um you know 99 percent of the uh, the population got absolutely no idea what's going on inside their router and so we, the challenge is to present it to to normal people in, in a way that they can understand so there's a there's a communications problem or sorry not problem but challenge here to uh, to get right and I, I just wonder what you think what is the best way of doing that i mean how, how are you getting the message out while well, you're doing it now but um uh but what ideas do you have how are we going to do this so in the early days of the internet it uh, was small enough that you could trust most people on it because they had to be from a university or a government contractor and on the internet and you should trust them the same way you would trust the overall human population that it represents and which is to say not completely um the things that have truly become global in scale and have really changed the way people work and live uh, have been the Amazons, the Facebooks, the Googles, because they are uh, well-resourced and they're well-motivated and they can find some way to uh, get into the hearts and minds and onto the lips of everybody. I don't know how to do that with this. So I am hearkening back to the earlier barn raising era of the internet. I'm talking to vendors. I'm talking to sort of wizards. I'm, tr I'm, I'm trying to make sure everybody knows this capability now exists so that they can figure out how to incorporate this into their plans. And I'm just hoping that indirectly those plans will reach a lot of end users. So the PF Sense uh, uh, example is quite salient. Um, it is. Well, I, I guess this... you're doing it right now by actually talking to all the uh, all the people who watch the VUC, and and that message That's will it. be promulgated. Uh, but it the, the magnitude of the challenge is just one that just um, is enormous. Well, so one of the things happening in 2017 is that containers are uh, rather explosively. So um, a lot of software vendors now are discovering that, yeah, they're still publishing .rpm files and .deb files and whatnot, but what people really want is a Docker container file or you know, what, a salt recipe or something uh, because you know, they, they don't want to this computer just to be a name server. They want you to give them something they can run and now as a VM image. Uh, so uh, I, will, I will say that in my day job, we are uh, working on such an image that would, um, that would give you a virtual appliance that did the recursive job for you and offered you this feature so that you could decide what to subscribe to and so forth. Um, I, my hope is that some of those people will take that free software and then uh, use it to subscribe to the RPZ feed that we publish, uh, but they could use it to subscribe to any RPZ of their choice or none if they, if they so chose that. So that's one of the things we're trying to do to get this out there. Uh, we also wrote the glue code to make this work in Unbound, largely maintain the part of the bind source code that, that implements this, and we are sort of doing all of that again to try to, to beef up the market. Um, but ultimately, it's going to require getting out there and telling folks 
uh, look, you don't have to use your ISP's name server, and 8.8.8.8 is not your only alternative. Uh, you could, you know, run your own in order to both protect your PII and inject policy that is aligned with your interests. Uh, so that's the real message, uh, which is recursive name servers used to be everywhere. Everybody had one. And now there are fewer and fewer because people think it's hard, and it's not in years. Wouldn't there be an anyway, argument? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go. No, go ahead. I was, I was just going to say, isn't there an argument, though? First of all, 95% um, of the people who use the Internet have no idea of any of this and could care less or couldn't care less, to be correct. Um, but wouldn't a once possible solution be um, the, for example, a browser, I don't want to say hardware where you buy a laptop and that's, you know, RPZ is built in and you can opt out of it, but some, some compromise where it's not the nanny state, it's not forced on everybody. It's certainly easily changed, but that whatever you get set up with knowing nothing at all, you're protected by the notion of, um, response policy without even knowing or caring about it. Um, and then you can learn about it if you have some reason to. Doesn't that make more sense? If we think that the web browser is going to be the only app they run, then yes. And Google Safe Browsing is an example of what you're talking about. It's a uh, distributed Bloom filter, updatable. Nobody knows they're running it, but we are all because it's on by default in whatever browser we're probably using. Um, and that works well, right? Google even set up a separate 501c3, but their corporate policy was not the only impact, the only way to get content into the safe browsing database. And so they, they accept contributions from others and so forth. They've, they've done us a solid and that protects the web user interface. Uh, but I have greater expectations for the internet P port uh, on TCP 80. And so I need this at a lower, lower level. And uh, once you get to a lower level, there isn't an analog for the browser as one. And it's just a matter of getting your technology into that. Uh, right? The closest analog we have is a name server. And so we've done what we can to get our software into the name servers. Fortunately, what you're talking about won't directly port over. Okay, Paul, so I kind of misspoke there. Yes, I was thinking of that as an example. I didn't know. Thanks for the information on Google. I did not know what they were actually doing uh, with that. I mean, they talk about safe browsing. I've never investigated it. But in that case, we're, how about, um, you know, I happen to be on a, on a MacBook Air. They have their networking uh, service, you know, the whole bottom uh, low-level stuff. Couldn't it be built into that? Uh, couldn't that be part of when I click on system? Uh, I don't want to say RPZ, but maybe a DNS section, which there is not right now. Isn't that possible to include it at a hardware level, at a low level software OS? So certainly for uh, even my Android smartphone here has thousands of times more transistors and uh, megahertz servers that uh, bind was developed and, and used on back in the 80s so uh, virtually all of the things people use which are kind of Mac Windows Android and iOS that's that really describes the edge uh, and you know the small percentage of Linux people also but certainly the big four uh, all of them could adopt this and say you know in addition to everything else we do we're gonna put a recursive name server into this phone it's got gigabytes of RAM and so forth it's not like it's gonna be hard and we're going to make the policy interface uh, available. Certainly be done. Uh, I have I a feeling thinking, that. I was thinking more I about a, a service. I'm sorry. I was thinking more about a service that you're, you know, in other words, I go to the, on the Mac system thing and I choose a service of many services that are available with some kind of a pattern because as a user, um, I don't know what I want to do anyway. I mean, I, I don't know the lists. I mean, if you take RBL, I mean, I've managed my own mail servers and messed with RBLs, but none, nobody that I've ever uh, had as a customer knows anything about that, obviously. So I'm saying that can't the OS, it, can't there be a service? Of course, then it's trust, I guess, but 
a service that, uh, so, in other words, not doing it on your own computer. Go ahead. In my web browser, I have a little applet or plugin or whatever they call it called uBlock, um, which is an ad blocker. And when I install it, it says, here's a list of the available content. And it's Joe's list and Henry's list and Paul's list and all the different lists and a short description of each one. And then it gives me this wonderful button. Click here to get the usual suspects, you know, to get the usual stuff. If you don't know what you want, you probably want this. And I do. And I get fewer ads, and it's great. And um, it's my view that something like that is within the means of any technologist or non-technologist user. Right? So if we had a DNS blocking thing that would happen as part of your network settings in Mac OS and Windows and so forth, and it had a big button to say, click here to get the usual stuff, uh, most people would say, I probably want that. And I think it would work well. Um, but I, I do want to say that um, with the ad blocking stuff, you're importing a bunch of highly compressed binary data into that plugin so that it is able to do lookups while you surf to decide, oh, this is in the ad blocker, I'm not going to fetch it. And that's very similar to safe browsing in terms of how you distribute the, the, the data and how small it is. Uh, this would need a little work to reach that point. Because right now, these things are big. Spam House, for example, has more than a million things in their RPZ, and it changes by 10% a day. And if we decided that we wanted a billion mobile browsers to all have an up-to-date copy of that in that form, um, I believe the Internet would, industry would not thank us for it. No, no, definitely no. Uh, I have a, a sideline question, though. How... Uh, we know that sometimes RBLs for uh, email filtering are catching up um, uh, incorrectly, some servers or something else that is, is uh, marked as a spam source because of uh, triggers, uh, probably too, too, too thin and too sensitive. Uh, how are the lists that are uh, underneath the DNS uh, list mm -hmm. service? of clearing uh, the DRPZ managed. Is, is there any intelligence uh, autom automatisms? There is how much manual intervention is there? Uh, how much more can be done uh, for that to be self-aware? Um, I'm sorry to say that very little work has been done in that area. I'm thinking about an extension of the protocol where putting the SOA record into the additional data section, we would also put a text record there explaining, by the way, this is because uh, I myself, even though I'm the inventor of this, times for an hour looking at my local policy feed, trying to figure out what I'm doing that's causing some lookup that my wife needs to do to look up some high school somewhere to fail. Uh, and I, I could use a little more diagnostic help from my, my other hat. Um, probably be recommending something like that once this uh, gets an RFC number and once the IETF is starting to uh, evolve it going forward. Uh, but at the moment, no. If, uh, if something gets blocked that shouldn't be, you'll know is which policy feed it was in. And... Uh, you know, the, the hope is that you won't subscribe to a policy whose operators you don't have contact with. If you don't know how to tell somebody, by the way, you just listed bbc.co.uk as a spammer, so I can't read the, the, the news today. If you don't know the, 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 the editor of that content in a way to tell them, you may have made a terrible mistake. My, this email will be the first of many that you receive today, then you probably shouldn't subscribe to that. Uh, but I realize that that won't scale either to a non-technical user base or to a billion-strong user base. So uh, some uh, more work is needed in the area you just described. Okay. Thank well, you. One of the early providers did, in fact, list startupbbc.co.uk, and I did have to call them. Anyway, go on. Yeah, I was just going to say, we should probably let you go. You've been on this for an hour. Uh, sorry to everybody that we got started late, but this has been fascinating, and I really, really appreciate the information that you've provided. And we'll make sure that we put links 
on the blog posts and everywhere else and, and tweet out uh, every, all these resources because I think that the people who are technically inclined will be able to reflect on it and maybe get something done. So with that, thank you. Well, thank you for all. inviting me. Really appreciate I, uh, it. I've wanted to come on your show for a while, but I didn't know that I had anything useful to say. So uh, thanks again for having me. All righty. You're very welcome. Talk to you. So that's about it. Uh, nobody else has any final announcements. James is gone. So we will bid you good day, good morning, good evening for now, and be back next week, of course, with another VUC.